Um, Sharon, as a lawyer, can you tell us what the definition is or isn't of a domestic dispute? Well, this, uh, I gave a talk about two weeks ago to the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers where the, the title of the talk was, um, Are You a Domestic Extremist? And what I said then is what I say now, which is that the answer doesn't really matter to the police. It doesn't really matter to the security services either because the definition has changed over the years from which was extremely broad to one which now, I must say, in large part due to litigation and, and Jenny's great work in asking questions, has been narrowed so that it's fairly similar to the definition of terrorism. However, in arguing that data should be retained on their domestic extremist database, or what they will refer to now as the National Special Branch Intelligence System, the police have specifically argued that it doesn't matter whether or not you are considered a domestic extremist, they would like to retain data about you because you are a protester. Because they need to keep data about innocent protesters so that then they can manage protest more effectively. Now, at this, I'm sure you're all asking, well, can I sign up for this innocent person's database? That would be great. I mean, you're not going to pay attention to me. Well, actually, no, because that's not what happens. Um, and what happened in John Katz's case, for example, um, 89 year old protester, never been convicted of an offence, uh, never heard of fly, driving through central London, gets picked out on an ANDR. Um, automatic number plate recognition system camera and search under the Terrorism Act and then realises he's been wanted for, for years and years and years. Is he the guy that used to sketch? He yes. is, he still does sketch, yeah. He, he, yeah. Drew, he, he did sketches of protests. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is what got him on the... But this is... So, so, but just tell us what... So, as I understand it, no parliament has not... There is not a bill of law that says this is a domestic... There is, but what is the definition that they work with? I'll tell you the current definition, uh, which is the activity of groups or individuals who commit or plan serious criminal activity motivated by political or ideological viewpoints is the most recent that we have. It used to talk about criminal acts of direct action, which is pretty much everything with really. it. I mean, I consider voting as direct action. And I think that's something we should all want to encourage. So, so that's the sort of very broad and woolly definition. And I thought it would be interesting to see how that works itself out. Because Jenny, a baroness and member of the London Assembly, found out recently that she is on the domestic extremist database. So I'd be interested to know how you found out about that. And also, what period does it cover? Does it cover your period as a non-elected and uh, ennobled Green protester or a different period? No, it actually started in 2002 and at that point I was a member of the Metropolitan Police Authority so I was actually there overseeing the police, not, um, not actually managing them in any way but scrutinising what they were doing. So they started to uh, follow me and, and um, gather intelligence on me when I was actually in a position to scrutinise them and they, as they thought it, make trouble, I would imagine. Um, but I was told this week that I'm not on the domestic extremist database anymore. Um, so that's my, my short, my 10 year, 12, 13 year time as domestic extremist is over. But uh, my being in house rules didn't stop them. And my being an elected person didn't stop them. My being the deputy mayor of London under Ken Livingston didn't stop them. And um, you pay ten pounds to get your file, and um, I and and fill in quite a long form. I don't know if you've done it. It's very tedious. And uh, when I got it, it was a few pages with little notes on it, saying things like um, Jenny Jones attended a Stop the War march, or Jenny Jones spoke in Trafalgar Square, or. And I, I said, it's, it looks like an intern's put it together. It's so pathetic. So, I mean, it's incredible intelligence. And somebody said, that's quite rude to interns. I've applied for my file from the, um, from the Metropolitan Police and from different police forces around the country. And um, my file actually is on one file, it's several files um, of attendance on demonstrations. So I was in the same campaign as John Cat actually. Um, and I've been an activist for 10, 15 years. Um, and it was several files of places where I've lived, um, conversations which uh, 
which I've had with officers on, on police officers on demonstrations, um, my attendance on hundreds of hundreds of demonstrations. Um, but I think what's what's more interesting is the, is the kind of things that aren't in the file. <coughs> For instance, I've been stopped um, and questioned about my work with corporate watch under Schedule Seven of the Terrorism Act um, at UK borders. Um, nothing about about those stops under Schedule Seven have, have been has been included in the file. I've also been monitored by um, undercover police officers. Uh, a, guy, a guy called a guy calling himself Marco Jacobs um, infiltrated the uh, campaign against our local arms factory. Um, around 10 years ago, and um, Clyde, me, and others were drinks. Um, we uh, had meetings around his house um, before we realised actually that he was an undercover police officer, or we suspected he was an undercover police officer. And as, as we suspected him, he, he left uh, Brighton, where, where, where we were living, and went to other parts of the country where we continued um, working as an undercover officer um, established. Uh, intimate relationships with, with activists. Cases that I've worked on in this field suggest that there's a conflation between activism and criminality. It's as if, if you are a member of a group of activists, that amounts to being a member of a criminal fraternity and you're treated in the same way. It's the same kind of levels of infiltration by undercover police officers, same level of surveillance. Um, it's completely the completion of peaceful protest with, with criminality, um, which I think has got us this mess in the first place. Um, at the end of last year, we learned that the Domestic Extremist Database had 2,000 records of various journalists and their activities. Now, the police have told me these are not files, they're only notes or editions, but who knows? I mean, I, I'm at the point now when I've gone from a sort of 1950s you know, trust in the police, actually hardly trusting any single one of them at all. And we, we, we saw, you know, with the Ian Tomlinson and stuff, by the way, they were quite happy to put out misinformation about how the crowd had thrown bottles and they, they couldn't help him. I mean, completely omitting the fact that it's a police officer who hit him in the first place. And then recently a whistleblower was, um, um, all sorts of misinformation lies were put out against her when she, um, wanted to expose what was happening in the police. So um, I, I think the police, bits of the police are almost out of control now. And of course the situation is going to get worse. I mean, I don't know if you agree with me, but there's the militarisation of the police, which is increasing. Um, more and more tasers, you know, various organisations, police organisations calling out for every single police officer to have a taser. Um, the commissioner here in London said that he didn't think so, but he immediately gave out another hundred. There's also um, an act has just gone, or a bill has just gone through Parliament, it's now an act on extra surveillance. So MI5 or spies and the police actually have greater powers to, to spy on us. Also the fact that the, the police actually don't know how many databases they've got. <laughs> I've actually asked them, they don't know to the nearest hundred. Well, I guess they don't even know to the nearest thousand because they just don't know how many they've got.